So when you look at standard of care, uh, you know, there are le different levels of evidence. Um, you know, in the US, the way we describe evidence is what would an average uh, standard of care is, what would an average doctor do in this case? And that becomes the standard of care. And the second thing is, if you go one level up, clinical practice guideline. Are you following your specialist specialty society's clinical practice guideline? You know, <clears throat> American Heart Association comes up with some guidelines. American College of Cardiology comes up with guidelines. You know, what does, what does the guideline say? So that is good. But real world evidence is one level up. The guidelines, the clinical practice guidelines that your society or organization comes up with is based on average population, right? Okay, if you're a diabetic, you need to control this, your blood pressure to be under, more, you know, 120 over 80, and that is the recommendation. But what is the specific recommendation for the patient in front of you? Does it have to be 70 over 100? Or could it be 85 over 125? So that specific or, uh, or that kind of specificity you can derive with real world evidence. And then, of course, the genes, the genome that where that's where you can go into precision medicine. But right now, we are not even using the real world evidence that we already have in our electronic health records. So I, I won't even go into precision medicine at this time. So uh, this, is the, this is the project that we did at, uh, at Kaiser Permanente, um, but we don't have to talk about that. So how does a learning health system work? You have to connect the physicians, the patients, and the researchers with the data. And then here in this case, Health Connect is the electronic health record. So you need an electronic health record. If your system is not using an electronic health record, then it is hard to do this kind of work. So you are getting data from your electronic health record and your researchers are asking the questions, analyzing the, the, the questions too. Okay, what should be the hemoglobin A1C for a patient to prevent you know, a bad outcome? Let's say an amputation of their leg because of peripheral vascular disease or, or, or diabetes complication, right? And then you study that from the electronic health record, and then you come up with a guideline and you compare that with your clinical practice guideline, and then you recommend those treatments to the physician. And the patient then is entering data into the system. You know, what is their hemoglobin A1C? Or, or for example, what is their weight? Uh, what is their blood pressure at, at home? And all that data comes back. And then it becomes a cycle where the data informs what the physician should do and the researcher is following this. And that is a learning healthcare system where the system gets better and better each time that it gets new data. And then the care gets better because the physician is able to see and the researcher is able to watch and recommend um, new guidelines. Um, I think I'll... I'm coming to an end of my time, 30 minutes. Um, I will stop there. Uh, I can go through some examples, but I will stop there. Let me see if I can stop uh, sharing. Dr. Yuli, if you like, you can continue and there's no issue. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, All right. No Let me you can go ahead. Get back to my... Get back to my... Give me just a second as I share my screen. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, yeah, it's just loading. 
Yeah, yeah, doctor, it's back on. Okay. So, what are the factors that are needed, you know, to to succeed in in developing a a learning healthcare system? Well, physicians play a very important role because physicians understand the medical science, right? You know, we are in a way changing the science of care delivery, changing the science, the clinical science, because, you know, this is new evidence that is coming from real world. And so it has to be physician run, physician approved. Um, That's number one. So the physicians have to be involved. Second thing is it has to decrease a physician's workload and effort and time that they spend on this. So you have to have the business side of uh, 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 or the organizational side of, of practices involved in this. And the third thing is the physician's incentives have to be aligned. For example, if I say that, oh, I'm going to use this system and decrease the number of heart attacks. Well, what will a cardiologist say? Hey, that is my business. I need patients with heart attacks. Otherwise, I will lose my income. So you cannot have physicians running on fee-for-service in a system like this. You have to incentivize them, pay them more so that they don't lose their revenue or, or income. And, and it also has to expedite patient care. It, it should not be more difficult for patients. It should be easier for patients to, to follow the system. So those are some of the factors I would say uh, that will help you succeed. Uh, I'll give you an exa- another example. Um, this is a system that I designed. Um, diabetes, you know, if you think about diabetes, you know, there are about 70 diabetes drugs on the market right now in the US. So how do you know which drug to prescribe to which patients, right? You know, you typically will have a handful of drugs that physicians are familiar with, that they have been trained on, trained with, and so those are the ones they use. Plus, whatever the medical rep says, you know, hey, this is a new medicine, you know, why don't you use it? And and so that that's how they get their information. What if you took? So this is a project we did uh, in a health system. They had 15 million electronic health records and claims records. Out of those, 1.5 million patients had type 2 diabetes. And so what we did was we split this 1.5 million population to see what kind of medications they are on for their diabetes. And then compare that with their hemoglobin A1C and see which ones are under good control, right? So there are the... There are the medicines and there are the the ones that are in good control. So let's say there is a drug A and 50% of the patients on drug A are are under good control. Now you go back and see what are the characteristics of these 50% patients that are responding to this drug. And so like that, you can do this kind of an analysis for all the drugs and you can identify the ideal patients for each drug. So what does that mean? That means that you know, you'll pick maybe five or 10 drugs that are most effective that'll work for 99% of the patients, which also means that 60 of the drugs that are in the market are totally useless, right? If the other drugs are getting you a better control of their diabetes, Um, maybe you should fine tune every single patient to the best possible drug that they could get. You can do that if you have the data. Of course, you know, there are a lot of other variables that go into, go into this equation. You know, what is the dosage? You know, how many did the patient fill the prescription? Does the patient have money to buy the medicine and all those other variables? I'm not I'm not discounting that, but it is possible to do this, and we did that we did that um, in in one example. 
And so this is how we do it. Um, you know, you drug one, drug two, and then see which ones are responding uh, and, and look at the outcomes. And then you figure out, and then you do a, uh, um, a clinical trial uh, using data only. You don't need to do a clinical trial in, in, in patients. You don't need to change any of the, those, um, the treatments that patients are getting, but you can track these patients and see how they respond to the drugs. Here is another um, project we did for the FDA. Uh, FDA is the, is the organization. It's a federal organization that looks at um, different treatments and different diseases and what what medications work best. Um, so this is COVID. Uh, this is a project. We looked at COVID patients who survived COVID and what happens to these patients after COVID. And uh, we looked at 35 million patient records that, ha uh, that we have access to. Out of those, how many patients have had COVID? And then we tracked those patients to see what happens to them. What we found was that <clears throat> these COVID patients, the risk of having a cardiovascular um, bad outcome was much higher than our typical population that did not get COVID. So you might, you will see COVID patients coming back with um, uh, cardiovascular outcome, you know, which is stroke, uh, heart attacks, um, you know, kidney failures, uh, peripheral vascular disease, and coming back with uh, ulcers and amputations in diabetic. And so we are seeing a much higher rate of these patients. And so we can actually prepare for this if you know that this person had has had COVID before. And so that is the beauty of, of this kind of uh, and so these are the outcomes. Uh, <clears throat> stroke, deep vein thrombosis, myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism. And it's pretty accurate at predicting which patients uh, will get this 